Have you ever wondered how an animal as grand and robust as the woolly mammoth vanished from the face of the earth? This colossal creature, a shaggy relative of the elephant, once roamed the icy expanses of North America, Europe and Asia, thriving in the harsh conditions of the last ice age. Yet as the climate warmed and their habitat began to shrink, the mammoth's reign started facing its twilight. The reasons behind their extinction remain an enigma. Some scientists propose that the mammoths fell prey to the relentless human hunt for their meat, bones, and majestic tusks. Yet, it's up for debate whether human hunting alone could have marked the end of this species. Others suggest that climate change, with the accompanying shifts in vegetation and habitat, delivered the final blow, pushing the mammoth populations into a corner from which they couldn't return. To unravel this mystery, we first need to understand the life and times of these magnificent creatures. The woolly mammoth, a cousin of today's elephants, was a true titan of the Ice Age. Roaming the frosty expanses of North America, Europe and Asia, these magnificent beasts were a testament to nature's ingenuity. They were not just survivors of the harsh Ice Age winters, they were masters of their icy domain. The woolly mammoth was a marvel of adaptation. Picture a creature standing up to three and a half meters tall at the shoulder. That's about the height of a single-story house. Its body was covered in a thick, shaggy coat of fur, providing insulation against the biting cold. Underneath the fur, a layer of fat up to four centimeters thick offered additional warmth and energy reserves. Now let's talk about those iconic tusks. These impressive dental structures could grow up to five meters long, not only a symbol of might, the tusks had a practical purpose too. The mammoths used them to dig through snow and ice to reach the vegetation beneath. Their humped backs, often mistaken for a sign of malnutrition, were actually reserves of fat that helped them endure the long, harsh winters. The woolly mammoths were not solitary wanderers, but social animals living in families and herds. Their range was vast, stretching from the British Isles in the west to North America in the east, and from the Arctic islands in the north to modern-day Germany and China in the south. They thrived in these cold habitats, feeding on grasses, herbs, and shrubs that flourished beneath the snow. But the world of the woolly mammoth was an ever-changing one. The Ice Age was not a static period of perpetual winter, but a time of dramatic climate fluctuations. As the millennia rolled on, the Earth began to warm and the icy landscapes that the mammoths had dominated for so long started to thaw. As the Ice Age neared its end, however, the world these creatures knew began to change dramatically. With the end of the Ice Age came a warmer climate, a change that the cold-adapted mammoths found challenging. As the Earth's temperature began to rise, the vast icy landscapes that the mammoths called home started to disappear. The tundra was replaced by forests and grasslands, a shift that had profound implications for these giants of the Ice Age. The woolly mammoths, with their thick fur and humped backs, were perfectly adapted to frigid conditions. They relied heavily on the tundra's vegetation for sustenance, feasting on grasses, herbs, and shrubs found in these cold environments. But as the Ice Age thawed, these plants became increasingly scarce. The forests and grasslands that replaced the tundra were dominated by different types of vegetation, ones that the mammoths weren't accustomed to or couldn't digest easily. This shift in vegetation would have put considerable stress on the mammoth populations. Food became harder to find, and the mammoths would have had to travel greater distances to find enough to eat. This would have been particularly challenging for the young, the old, and the sick, making them more vulnerable to predators and disease. The changing climate also meant changes in the mammoth's habitat. As the ice receded, the mammoth's range became fragmented. Populations were isolated from each other, which could have led to a decrease in genetic diversity. This loss of diversity could have made the mammoths more susceptible to disease and less able to adapt to their rapidly changing environment. So the thawing of the Ice Age presented a multitude of challenges for the woolly mammoths. Their food sources dwindled, their habitats changed, and their populations became isolated. These factors, combined with the physical stress of adapting to a warmer climate, would have put significant pressure on these magnificent creatures. But climate change, 
wasn't the only threat the mammoths faced. They also had to contend with a new predator, humans. As we'll see in the next scene, this combination of environmental change and increasing human pressure proved to be a fatal mix for the woolly mammoths. As humans spread across the globe, they came into conflict with the mammoths for resources. This wasn't some minor squabble over the last piece of cake at a party, but a fight for survival. Picture this, early humans armed with primitive weapons facing off against these enormous shaggy behemoths. It seems almost impossible, doesn't it? But the evidence is there, carved into the bones of long dead mammoths and etched into our collective human history. The mammoths were more than just adversaries to our ancestors. They were a source of life. Their meat provided food, their bones were used for tools and shelter, and their tusks. Well, those were the ancient equivalent of gold, used for trading and crafting into precious objects. In essence, the mammoths were the supermarkets of the Ice Age. But here's the big question. Was it our ancestors' appetite for mammoth steaks and ivory trinkets that led to the mammoths' downfall? Or were there other factors at play? This is where the plot thickens, and where scientists are still trying to piece together the puzzle. Some argue that human hunting was the main driver behind the mammoth's extinction. After all, our ancestors were pretty good at hunting, and mammoths were a prime target. Others, however, believe that while hunting certainly didn't help the mammoth's cause, it wasn't the sole reason for their demise. They point to climate change, shifts in vegetation, and habitat loss as additional stresses that would have made life increasingly difficult for these Ice Age giants. One thing is clear though, our ancestors played a role in the extinction of the mammoths. Whether it was the main act or just a supporting role, we'll probably never know for sure. While the exact cause of their extinction may still be a topic of debate, the loss of the woolly mammoth is a stark reminder of the impact we can have on the natural world. So, what led to the disappearance of these magnificent Ice Age giants? In our journey through time, we've walked alongside woolly mammoths, these colossal creatures that ruled the icy landscapes of North America, Europe, and Asia. They were the epitome of resilience. Perfectly equipped to thrive in the harsh cold with their dense fur, humped back, and imposing tusks. Yet as the curtains fell on the Ice Age and the world began to warm, the mammoths found themselves in a fight for survival. Their once expansive icy homeland contracted, and they were thrust into a competition for resources. A competition that included a new challenger, humans. Humans, with their growing populations and evolving tools, hunted the mammoths. They sought the mammoths for their meat, bones, and the prized tusks. But the question that has puzzled scientists for years is whether this hunting was enough to push the mammoths into the abyss of extinction. It's likely that the mammoths were fighting a war on two fronts. As they grappled with human hunters, the warming climate was reshaping their world, altering the vegetation and shrinking their habitats. This climate change, coupled with hunting pressures, may have delivered the final blow to the mammoth populations. As we ponder the fate of the woolly mammoth, it reminds us of the delicate balance of life on our planet and the profound impact we can have on it. Have you ever wondered why we can't see the dodo bird anymore? Let's delve into the tale of the dodo, a bird that once strutted the earth, yet is now nothing more than a haunting echo in the annals of history. The dodo was no ordinary bird. It was a feathered enigma cloaked in mystery and intrigue. Native to the lush tropical island of Mauritius, the dodo was a creature like no other. It was a large, flightless bird standing about three feet tall and tipping the scales at around 20 kilograms. Its plumage was a dull gray, while its beak, a stark contrast, was a striking blend of green, yellow, and black. The dodo's stout legs supported its hefty body, but its tiny wings were a stark reminder of its inability to take to the skies. The dodo's habitat was as unique as the bird itself. Mauritius, an island lost in the vast Indian Ocean, was a paradise isolated from the rest of the world. This isolation played a vital role in shaping the dodo's evolution. As there were no natural predators to fear, 
the bird lost its ability to fly over centuries of evolution. It lived a life of blissful ignorance, unaware of the dangers lurking beyond its island sanctuary. The dodo's oblivion to danger was further exacerbated by its peculiar trait of not fearing humans. This lack of fear was not a sign of bravery, but rather an unfortunate consequence of its secluded lifestyle. The bird had no reason to fear humans, for it had never encountered them. This innocence, however, would prove to be its downfall. The dodo, a bird that was a marvel of evolution, was confined to a small corner of the world. It was an avian anomaly that did not fear humans, and it was unable to take flight. This was a bird that despite its physical grandeur and unique nature, was ill-prepared for the brutality of the outside world. A bird that didn't fear humans existed in a small region and didn't fly. The perfect setup for a tragedy. Imagine stepping onto an island and encountering a bird that shows no fear of humans. A curious sight indeed, and one that the Dutch sailors, the first recorded visitors to the island of Mauritius, experienced in the late 16th century. This peculiar bird, as tall as a turkey, with a stout body, a hooked beak and feathers of a grayish hue, was unlike anything they'd ever seen. It waddled its way towards the sailors, its small wings fluttering in a display of innocent curiosity, a creature so alien yet so unafraid it was a sight to behold. The sailors called it dodo, a derivative of the Dutch word dodas, meaning fat ass, a rather unsophisticated moniker for such a fascinating creature, but it stuck. The dodo bird, as we know it today, was born. But the dodo's lack of fear was its downfall. Unfamiliar with predators, it did not run or fly away when approached. This made it an easy target for the sailors, who found it a convenient source of fresh meat. However, accounts from the time suggest that the dodo's meat was not particularly tasty, but when food was scarce, it was enough. Moreover, the sailors' arrival disturbed the equilibrium of the island's ecosystem. The dodo, which had evolved over thousands of years in isolation, suddenly found itself contending with new threats. The sailors brought with them other animals like dogs, pigs and monkeys who plundered the dodo's nests feasting on their eggs. In the blink of an eye, the dodo's world was turned upside down. From living a peaceful existence on an island where it had no natural predators, the dodo was suddenly thrust into a fight for survival, a fight it was ill-equipped to win. And so the first domino falls, beginning the tragic tale of the dodo bird's extinction. As we delve deeper into this story, we'll examine how human intervention played a pivotal role in the rapid decline of this unique and intriguing bird. As more and more humans arrived, the dodo's peaceful existence was shattered. The Dutch, in their quest for spices and new territories, set their sights on the unspoiled island of Mauritius in the late 16th century. With the arrival of these seafarers, the tranquil life of the dodo was about to take a turn for the worse. The Dutch invasion wasn't a hostile takeover in the traditional sense. There were no battles to be won, no native population to subdue. Instead, the Dutch found an island paradise teeming with unfamiliar animals and lush vegetation. The dodo, with its inability to fly and lack of fear of humans, was an easy target for these newcomers. But it wasn't just the hunting that posed a threat to the dodo. As the Dutch established their presence on the island, they began to alter the landscape to suit their needs. Forests were cut down to make way for plantations, stripping the dodo of its natural habitat. The birds, once free to roam the island, were now confined to smaller and smaller areas, struggling to find food and shelter. But perhaps the most devastating blow to the dodo population came with the introduction of new species to the island. The Dutch brought with them pigs, monkeys, and rats, invasive species that competed with the dodo for resources. These new arrivals had a significant impact on the island's ecosystem, disrupting the balance that had existed for millennia. The dodo, once unchallenged and thriving, was ill-equipped to handle these changes. They couldn't compete with the invasive species, nor could they adapt to the rapid transformation of their environment. The dodo, a creature that had evolved over millions of years to fit perfectly into its niche, was suddenly out of place in its own home. The dodo bird, once the king of its domain, 
now found itself fighting for survival. The invasion of Mauritius marked the beginning of the end for this unique bird, setting it on a path towards extinction that it could not divert from. The dodo bird's decline was as swift as it was brutal. In a matter of decades, this flightless wonder of nature was driven to the edge of oblivion. The reasons are manifold with hunting, habitat destruction, and competition with invasive species being the main culprits. The Dutch colonists who landed on Mauritius in the late 16th century saw the dodo as a source of easy meat. Being flightless and unafraid of humans, they were easy pickings for hungry sailors. The birds were clubbed to death, their eggs plundered, and their young taken by the hundreds. It wasn't sport, it wasn't malice, it was a simple matter of survival for the colonists, but for the dodo, it spelled disaster. Next came the onslaught on their home. The lush forests of Mauritius were raised to make way for sugarcane plantations. The dodo's habitat was systematically destroyed, leaving them homeless and exposed. Without the cover of the forest, they were even more vulnerable to hunting and predation. But perhaps the most insidious threat to the dodo came from the very ships that brought the colonists. Stowed away in the holds were rats, cats, and pigs, foreign species to Mauritius. Once they were on the island, they thrived. These invasive species wreaked havoc on the dodo's nests, devouring eggs and chicks with impunity. The dodo, having evolved without natural predators, had no defense against these relentless invaders. The combined effect of these assaults was catastrophic. The dodo population, once plentiful, dwindled at a terrifying pace. Within a few decades, sightings of the bird became increasingly rare. They retreated deeper into the shrinking forests, their numbers falling year after year. In less than a century, the dodo bird was on the brink of extinction. The rapidity of the decline was shocking, a stark reminder of just how devastating human interference can be on a species. The dodo had thrived in isolation for thousands of years, Yet within a blink of an eye in the grand timeline of history, they were pushed to the precipice. Can you imagine being the last of your kind? In the late 17th century, the dodo bird, a creature so unique and distinctive, began to vanish from the lush green landscapes of Mauritius. The last known sightings of this remarkable bird were recorded around 1681. With the dodo's disappearance, the world lost more than just a species. We lost a symbol of the wild, untamed beauty of nature, a creature that had lived and thrived on its own terms. As the years passed, the dodo's absence was felt more profoundly. Reports from sailors and explorers once filled with tales of these curious, flightless birds fell silent. The forests of Mauritius, once punctuated by the dodo's distinctive call, grew quieter. The realization of the dodo's extinction was a slow, creeping dread that gradually dawned upon those who remembered the bird's existence. The loss of the dodo was not just a loss for Mauritius, but for the world. It marked the first time that humanity had to confront the harsh reality of our impact on the natural world. This was not the loss of an individual creature. This was the loss of an entire species, a void that could never be filled. The impact of the dodo's extinction was felt far and wide, it sparked a revolution in our understanding of the natural world and our role within it. It marked a turning point, a moment of realization that our actions have consequences, that we hold the power of life and death over the species that share our planet. The dodo bird's tail is a stark reminder of the damage we can cause when we act without consideration for the delicate balance of nature. It is a story of loss, but also a story of enlightenment. It is a reminder that we are not separate from the natural world but a part of it, and that our survival is intrinsically linked to the survival of all species. The dodo bird's tail serves as a stark reminder of the impact of human actions on our environment. The dodo bird, gone but not forgotten, its tail continues to echo in the chambers of time, a poignant reminder of the irreversible damage caused by human recklessness. In the annals of extinction, the dodo stands as a symbol, its name synonymous with the tragic loss of species at the hands of human intervention. Its unique form, its flightless nature, its untimely demise, all have etched the dodo into the collective consciousness of humanity. 
In the grand tapestry of life, every thread matters. The dodo bird's absence left a gaping hole, an irreplaceable loss in the intricate web of biodiversity. Its story serves as a stark reminder of the delicate balance of life and the devastating consequences of tipping the scales. As we remember the dodo bird, let its story be a reminder of our responsibility to protect and preserve our planet's biodiversity. For once lost, no power on Earth can bring back the chorus of a silenced songbird. Have you ever wondered why certain species disappear from our planet forever? This is a question that has puzzled mankind for centuries. Today, we delve into the intriguing tale of one such creature, the Caribbean monk seal, or Neomonicus tropicalis, a species that once graced the turquoise waters of the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. The Caribbean monk seal was first recorded by Christopher Columbus during his second voyage to the New World in the late 15th century. He and his crew described encountering strange sea wolves, a moniker that would later be understood to reference these unique marine mammals. Possessing a sleek torpedo-shaped body and a dark brown to black coat, these seals were perfectly adapted to their tropical marine environment. The Caribbean monk seal was no small creature. With males growing up to eight feet in length and weighing in at around 400 pounds, they were a significant presence in their native habitat. Females were slightly smaller, but no less formidable, making this species one of the most impressive marine mammals of its region. Early human interactions with the Caribbean monk seal were, sadly, a harbinger of what was to come. Initially, their population was estimated to be in the tens of thousands, spread across the warm waters of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. These seals were sociable creatures, often seen basking in the sun on the sandy shores and rocky outcrops of the region's islands. Yet these very characteristics that made them a unique and integral part of their ecosystem also made them easy targets for early explorers and settlers. Their large size and sociable nature, coupled with their slow movement on land, made them easy prey. These seals were hunted for their oil-rich blubber, coveted for lighting lamps and lubricating machinery. As we journey through time, we will uncover the sad tale of the Caribbean monk seal's demise. We will explore how human activity sealed the fate of this remarkable creature, leading to its mysterious disappearance and ultimately its declaration of extinction. Tune in as we unravel this tragic tale of loss and the lessons we can learn from it. So what turned this thriving species into a memory? The answer, unfortunately, lies with us, humans. Let's take a step back in time to the 18th and 19th centuries. The Caribbean monk seal, with its oil-rich blubber, became a sought-after commodity. This wasn't just any oil, it was of high quality, serving multiple purposes from lighting lamps to lubricating machinery. And so the commercial hunting of these seals commenced, driven by the promise of profit. Hunters armed with harpoons would set out to sea, their sights set on these gentle creatures. The seals stood no chance. In the pursuit of profit, we overlooked the cost to the environment. We took more than the ocean could replenish. We disrupted a delicate balance, and the seals paid the price. The oil that once lit our lamps now cast a dark shadow over the future of the Caribbean monk seal. But it wasn't just the hunting that led to their downfall. Overfishing of the seals' food sources added another layer to this tragic tale. Fishermen, in their quest for a bountiful catch, depleted the waters of fish and other marine life. This left the seals in a dire situation. Their once abundant food sources were dwindling, and with it, their chances of survival. We must remember, the ocean is a vast, interconnected ecosystem. Every action has a ripple effect. When we take too much, something else gives. In this case, it was the Caribbean monk seal. They were caught in a cycle of exploitation and depletion, a cycle that proved devastating. The consequences of our actions were stark. The once thriving population of seals began to shrink. Each passing year brought fewer sightings. What was once a common sight in the Caribbean Sea and Gulf of Mexico became a rarity. The seals' numbers dwindled, and by the 20th century, sightings became increasingly rare. 
The seals' numbers dwindled, and by the 20th century, sightings became increasingly rare. As the 20th century rolled in, the Caribbean monk seal was already teetering on the brink of extinction. A chilling reality, yet one that was met with little concern at the time. The seal's population, once thriving and plentiful, had been decimated to a mere fraction of what it once was, thanks to relentless hunting and competition with fishermen. In the early decades of the 20th century, sightings of these elusive creatures became increasingly rare. The last confirmed sighting of the Caribbean monk seal occurred in 1952. A fisherman, out on his usual route, spotted a small group of seals lounging on a remote rocky outcrop. Little did he know he was witnessing the final curtain call of a species on the verge of vanishing forever. Yet, hope lingered. Over the years there were whispers of unconfirmed sightings, a glint of shiny skin here, a distinctive bark there. Each report spurred renewed efforts to locate these elusive marine mammals. Expeditions were launched, researchers combed the coasts, and locals were interviewed. The Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, once teeming with these seals, were scoured in the hope of finding any remaining individuals. These searches were not in vain. They fostered a greater understanding of the plight of these seals and the devastating impact of human interference on their existence. They also shed light on the urgent need for conservation efforts to prevent other species from meeting the same fate. Yet the Caribbean monk seal remained elusive. Despite intensive efforts, each search proved fruitless. The Caribbean monk seal, once a common sight in these warm waters, had disappeared. The seas were silent, the rocky outcrops vacant. The seal had slipped away, unnoticed, into the pages of history. Despite these efforts, no confirmed sightings were made after 1952. The Caribbean monk seal, a species that had once thrived in these waters, was gone. Its disappearance serves as a stark reminder of our responsibility in preserving the delicate balance of our planet's ecosystems. With no confirmed sightings for several decades, the inevitable conclusion was reached. The Caribbean monk seal, a once abundant inhabitant of the Caribbean Sea and Gulf of Mexico, was declared extinct in 2008 by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. It was a heartbreaking verdict, marking the end of an era for this unique marine mammal. But what led to this tragic conclusion? The finger, undeniably, points at us, the humans. We hunted these seals relentlessly for their oil-rich blubber, a precious commodity in an age before synthetic alternatives. Fishermen saw them as competition, further accelerating their decline. We stripped them of their habitats, disturbed their breeding grounds, and pushed them to the brink of oblivion. This extinction didn't happen overnight. It was a slow burn, a creeping tragedy that stretched over centuries of human encroachment and exploitation. The Caribbean monk seal's fate was sealed long before the last one vanished from our sights. It was a silent, unnoticed casualty of our progress and expansion. But in this lamentable tale, there are lessons to be learned. The extinction of the Caribbean monk seal is a chilling testament to our capacity to wipe out an entire species. It is a stark reminder of our power and our responsibility. We are not just passive inhabitants of this planet, we are its stewards, its guardians. And with that role comes the duty to protect and preserve its biodiversity. The Caribbean monk seal's story underscores the urgency of conservation efforts. It's a call to action, a plea from the past to safeguard our future. We need to ensure that no other species suffer the same fate, that no other creature is lost to the annals of history because of our actions. The Caribbean monk seal serves as a stark reminder of the devastating impacts of human activities on our planet's biodiversity. It's a lesson we must heed, a warning we cannot afford to ignore. Because if we don't act now, we might one day find ourselves on the brink, staring down the abyss of our own making. Let's take a moment to reflect on the tale of the Caribbean monk seal. This majestic creature, Neomonicus tropicalis, was once a thriving species native to the azure expanse of the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. Yet it vanished, leaving behind a void in our marine biodiversity. The Caribbean monk seal's tail began when it was discovered by humans, its sleek form and curious nature making it a fascinating sight. However, 
This discovery marked the beginning of a treacherous journey for this marine mammal. Its oil-rich blubber became a coveted resource, leading to merciless exploitation by humans. The seal's life was not only threatened by hunters who sought its blubber, but also by fishermen who viewed it as competition for fish stocks. The last sightings of this seal species were reported around the mid-20th century. The year 1952 stands as a somber timestamp in the annals of the Caribbean monk seal's existence. The final sightings were a haunting prelude to the inevitable, a silent farewell from a species on the brink of extinction. In 2008, the final verdict was declared. The Caribbean monk seal was officially declared extinct, a tragic end to a species that once flourished in our oceans. This marked not just the loss of a species but also a stark reminder of the devastating impact of human activities on the world's biodiversity. The tale of the Caribbean monk seal is a call to action for us all, a reminder that our actions today will determine the survival of species tomorrow. Have you ever wondered what happened to the Tasmanian tiger? Well, let's unravel the mystery together. The Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylacine, was a fascinating creature. A marsupial carnivore that called Tasmania, Australia and New Guinea home, it was a remarkable example of nature's ingenuity. The Tasmanian tiger was not a tiger at all, but rather a marsupial with a striking resemblance to a dog. Its most distinctive feature was its series of bold, dark stripes that ran down its back and tail, giving it an unmistakable tiger-like appearance. And let's not forget its kangaroo-like pouch, a characteristic that further accentuated its unique charm. But despite its captivating allure, the Tasmanian tiger's story is a tragic one. The last known individual passed away in captivity in 1936, marking the end of this unique species. But what led to their extinction? Stay tuned as we delve into the story of the Tasmanian tiger's demise. The Tasmanian tiger, a marvel of nature, first crossed paths with European settlers towards the end of the 18th century. As they ventured into the uncharted terrains of Australia, these explorers stumbled upon a creature that was unlike anything they had ever seen. A marsupial with a striking striped coat, a head resembling a wolf, and a pouch like a kangaroo, the Tasmanian tiger was a unique blend of the familiar and the extraordinary. The settlers were initially captivated by this unusual creature. Its distinctive features sparked curiosity and fascination as they tried to understand and categorize this new discovery. Yet, the Tasmanian tiger was not just another exotic animal in the vast Australian wilderness. It was a symbol of the untamed and the unknown, a living testament to the rich biodiversity of the land. However, this fascination soon turned into fear and suspicion, leading to a tragic turn of events for the Tasmanian tiger. As European settlers began to establish farms, they saw the Tasmanian tiger as a threat to their livestock. A fear was born, a fear born from misunderstanding and misconceptions. The thylacine, this enigmatic creature, was seen not as a part of the rich tapestry of nature, but as a menace, a danger to their way of life. This fear, this misunderstanding, led to a dark chapter in the history of human-wildlife interactions. The settlers, driven by their fear and need to protect their livestock, began hunting the Tasmanian tiger. It was a relentless pursuit, often driven less by necessity and more by a sense of misplaced vengeance. But it wasn't just individual settlers who were involved in this. The government, too, played its part. Bounties were placed on the Tasmanian tiger. It was as if a price had been set on their heads, a price that spoke volumes about the value we placed on their lives. The message was clear. The Tasmanian tiger was unwanted, a pest to be eradicated. And so the hunting continued, spurred on by these bounties. The impact on the Tasmanian tiger population was devastating. With each passing day, their numbers dwindled, their presence in the wild becoming scarcer and scarcer. The bounty hunters were efficient in their task, their actions fueled by fear and incentivized by financial gain. But the hunting was not the only factor contributing to the Thylacine's decline. Habitat destruction, 
a side effect of the rapidly expanding human settlements, further compounded the problem. The forests that were once their homes were now being raised to make way for farms and settlements. The Tasmanian tiger, already beleaguered by hunting, now had to contend with the loss of their natural habitat. The hunting, along with habitat destruction, had a devastating impact on the Tasmanian tiger population. These twin threats, a result of human fear and misunderstanding, drove this unique marsupial carnivore to the brink of extinction. And as we will see, it was a brink from which they would never recover. By the early 20th century, the Tasmanian tiger was a rare sight. A chilling reminder of the fleeting existence of this unique creature, a marsupial carnivore unlike any other. As the dawn of the 20th century broke, the Tasmanian tiger was already on the brink of oblivion. The relentless assault of human persecution had decimated their numbers to a tragic few. Conservation efforts were initiated, but alas, they began too late to turn the tide for this beleaguered species. Despite a growing understanding of the importance of biodiversity and a burgeoning sentiment for the protection of wildlife, the Tasmanian tiger's fate was already sealed. The last known Tasmanian tiger, a haunting symbol of a species driven to extinction, was a captive in the Hobart Zoo. Nicknamed Benjamin, this creature was the final beacon of a species that once roamed freely across Tasmania, Australia, and New Guinea. Benjamin's life was not one of open fields and dense forests, but of cold iron bars and curious onlookers. Benjamin's days were spent in captivity, his nights echoing with the lonely calls of a species on the brink of oblivion. His life, a stark contrast to the wild existence his ancestors had known, was a testament to the destructive power of human interference on the natural world. In September 1936, a chilling silence fell over the Hobart Zoo. Benjamin, the last known Tasmanian tiger, had died. His death marked the end of an era, the end of a species that had added a unique thread to the rich tapestry of our planet's biodiversity. The Tasmanian tiger was no more. The extinction of the Tasmanian tiger serves as a potent reminder of the devastating impact of human actions on the natural world. A reminder that, once lost, no amount of regret can bring a species back from the abyss of extinction. With the death of this individual, the Tasmanian tiger was declared extinct. A declaration that echoed across the world, a stark reminder of the power we hold and the responsibility that comes with it. The story of the Tasmanian tiger is a tragic tale of misunderstanding and fear leading to extinction. This narrative isn't unique to the Tasmanian tiger, but echoes throughout history, painting a somber picture of our relationship with the natural world. We have seen too often that fear and ignorance can lead to irreversible damage. Yet, within this story, there is a potential for change. The extinction of the Tasmanian tiger prompts us to reflect on our actions and their consequences. It's an opportunity to learn from our past mistakes and strive to do better. We need to recognize the intrinsic value of every species, understanding that each plays a vital role in the intricate tapestry of life on Earth. The loss of one can affect many, disrupting delicate ecosystems and causing ripples that are felt far and wide. Today, we see a growing global movement towards conservation, fueled by a desire to protect and preserve the world's biodiversity. Efforts are being made to safeguard endangered species, protect habitats, and educate the public about the importance of biodiversity. From local initiatives to international agreements, we are starting to see the tide turn. Yet there is still much to be done. We must continue these efforts, not just for the sake of the animals, but for our own as well. For in the words of naturalist John Muir, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Our fate is intertwined with that of the natural world. We depend on it for our survival and well-being. The Tasmanian tiger may be gone, but it is not forgotten. Its story serves as a stark reminder of the impact humans can have on wildlife and the importance of conservation. As we move forward, let us bear in mind the lessons learned from the Tasmanian tiger. Let's strive to foster a world where every species is valued, where fear and misunderstanding are replaced with knowledge and respect, 
because in the end, the survival of the natural world is also the survival of our own. Have you ever heard about the quagga? No, it's not a mythical creature. It was as real as the zebras you see today. Meet the quagga, a fascinating subspecies of the plains zebra that once roamed freely in the wild landscapes of South Africa. Unlike its zebra cousins, the quagga boasted a unique coat that was a beautiful blend of stripes and solids. Its front was adorned with the familiar black and white stripes, but as your eyes traveled down its body, the stripes would gradually fade into a solid brown on its rear. This striking appearance made it a standout in the animal kingdom. Its native habitat, the arid, semi-desert regions of South Africa where it thrived in the wild, free and majestic. But as we journey through time, we find that the quagga's tail takes a tragic turn. Sadly, the quagga is no longer with us. But how did this happen? With the arrival of European settlers in South Africa, the fate of the quagga began to change drastically. In the 17th century, South Africa's landscape underwent a transformation as European settlers, primarily the Dutch, set foot on its shores. Drawn by the promise of a new world, they brought with them their customs, culture, and a keen sense for opportunity. But unbeknownst to them, their arrival marked the beginning of a dire era for the quagga. The quagga, a subspecies of the plains zebra, was an integral part of South Africa's rich biodiversity. With its unique half-striped coat, it roamed the plains and valleys, living in harmony with nature's rhythm. But the arrival of these settlers disrupted this harmony. The settlers, eager to establish their livelihoods, turned to hunting as a means to sustain themselves. For them, the quagga represented a source of meat and hides, commodities that were not only useful for survival but also held monetary value. As they ventured further into the heart of South Africa, their hunting practices evolved, becoming more systematic and ruthless. As the 19th century rolled around, the quagga's situation became more dire. The plains of South Africa that once echoed with the quagga's distinctive call grew unsettlingly silent as the creature's numbers dwindled. The quagga, a unique subspecies of the plains zebra, was being hunted relentlessly. But why was this creature, with its striking half-striped pattern, targeted so persistently? The answer lies in the simple, brutal economics of demand and supply. The European settlers, who had now made South Africa their home, developed a taste for the quagga's meat. This wasn't a frivolous choice, but a necessity born out of survival. The settlers were in unfamiliar territory, and the quagga provided a readily available source of food. But it wasn't just the meat that was in demand. The quagga's hide, with its unique pattern, quickly became a sought-after commodity. The hide was used for a variety of purposes, from clothing to upholstery. The settlers, eager to make a life in this new land, saw the quagga as a resource to be exploited. The market for quagga meat and hides grew, and so did the hunting. Driven by demand, the hunting of quaggas escalated at an alarming rate. It wasn't long before the quagga's numbers began to fall drastically. The plains of South Africa, once teeming with these creatures, began to empty. The quagga's distinctive call became less frequent, their unique half-striped pattern less visible. Quagga's decline was rapid and brutal. Despite this, there was little to no attempt to curb the hunting. The settlers' need for survival, coupled with the growing market for quagga meat and hides, created a deadly situation for the quagga. The settlers, focused on their survival and prosperity, paid little heed to the consequences of their actions. Tragically, the quagga was unable to adapt or fight back against this new threat. The creature, once a common sight on the plains of South Africa, was being pushed to the brink of extinction. Unfortunately, the quagga couldn't escape its fate. By the late 1870s, the quagga was nearing its end. A chilling reality bore down on the plains of South Africa as the last wild quagga fell to the unyielding onslaught of European settlers. The year was somewhere in the late 1870s. The plains once echoed with the cacophony of a thriving quagga population. But now only silence reigned. The last wild quagga, a creature that had once symbolized the wild, unspoiled beauty of South Africa, 
was now nothing more than a target in the crosshairs of a hunter's rifle. The unique, half-striped, half-solid hide of the quagga was a coveted prize, a symbol of conquest over nature, and that was its undoing. But the story of the quagga's demise doesn't end there. Even as the last wild quagga breathed its last on the African plains, a few of its kin still lived, but they were confined within the sterile walls of zoos, far away from their native lands. One of these captive quaggas was a female who resided in the Amsterdam Zoo. The year 1883 dawned with a somber note for the quagga. The female in the Amsterdam Zoo, the last of her kind, passed away that year. Her death echoed around the world, marking the extinction of a species that had once roamed freely across the plains of South Africa. The quagga, a unique subspecies of the plains zebra, was no more. In the grandeur of nature, a unique chapter had come to a close. It was a stark reminder of the destructive power of human expansion and greed, a reminder that continues to resonate even today. The quagga's extinction was a tragedy, a loss that reverberated through time, shaking the very foundations of our understanding of our relationship with nature. And just like that, the quagga was gone. This statement, while simple, carries with it a profound weight. It serves as a somber reminder of the consequences of our actions and the irreversible damage that can be done when we disregard the balance of nature. The extinction of the quagga is a haunting tale, but it's one we can learn from. And learn we must, for history is a profound teacher. The demise of the quagga, a unique subspecies of the plain zebra, is a stark reminder of the irreversible damage that can result from reckless hunting and unsustainable practices. The quagga's tale underscores the importance of conservation, of preserving and protecting our world's rich biodiversity. It's a call to action, a call for us to respect our co-inhabitants of this planet. Every creature, large or small, plays a critical role in the intricate web of life. When one species disappears, it can send ripples through ecosystems, disrupting the delicate balance that nature has so finely tuned. But the story of the quagga also highlights our capacity for change and growth. In the 19th century, the concept of species conservation was practically non-existent. The quagga was hunted for its meat and hides, its population decimated with little thought for the consequences. Today, we're more aware, more conscious of the impact our actions can have on the world around us. This heightened awareness has led to significant strides in conservation. We've established national parks and wildlife reserves, enacted laws to protect endangered species, and developed sustainable practices to minimize our impact on the environment. We've even made attempts to revive extinct species, including the quagga, through selective breeding programs. Yet there's still much work to be done. Many species across the globe are teetering on the brink of extinction, threatened by habitat loss, climate change, and human activities. We must heed the lessons of the quagga, harnessing our knowledge, resources, and collective will to safeguard these species. Through the quagga's story, we are reminded of our responsibility to protect our planet's diverse wildlife. Have you ever wondered how a species that once thrived in vast numbers can suddenly vanish from existence? The Pyrenean ibex is one such species. Imagine, if you will, a wild goat, sturdy and agile, whose natural playground were the rugged landscapes of the Pyrenean mountains, straddling the borders of Spain and France. This formidable creature, known as the Pyrenean ibex, or the bucardo, was a sight to behold, an integral part of the ecosystem, and a testament to the resilience and adaptability of life in the high mountains. However, in a turn of events as baffling as it is tragic, this species is no longer with us. The last known individual, a female named Celia, breathed her last in the year 2000, marking the end of an era. A species that was once widespread, that had stood the test of time and the harshness of its habitat, was now nothing more than a memory. But how did this happen? How did a species so robust and widespread disappear from the face of the earth? The mystery surrounding the extinction of the Pyrenean ibex is a complex one, 
intertwined with factors like overhunting and habitat loss. But it's more than just a tale of a species lost. It's a crucial lesson in the delicate balance of our ecosystems and our role within them. Understanding the reasons behind the extinction of species like the Pyrenean ibex is not just an exercise in historical curiosity. It's a vital step in preventing similar tragedies in the future. It's a call to action, a reminder of the profound impact we have on our planet and its myriad forms of life. So, let's journey back in time, back to the rugged peaks and valleys of the Pyrenees, to the world of the Pyrenean ibex. Let's delve into their story, their trials and tribulations, their rise and fall. Let's unravel the mystery, the enigma of extinction. Let us take a deep dive into the life and times of the Pyrenean ibex, who uncover the events leading to its extinction. The Pyrenean ibex was a unique subspecies of wild goat that was native to the Pyrenees mountains of Spain and France. These creatures were a marvel of nature possessing a distinct grace and agility that allowed them to traverse the rugged terrains of the Pyrenees with ease. Their bodies were well adapted to the harsh climate and rocky landscapes. With a sturdy build, short legs, and a thick coat, they were built for survival. The males, known for their majestic curved horns, were a sight to behold, while the females, smaller and more delicate, held their own charm. The diet of the Pyrenean ibex was simple yet effective. They grazed on an assortment of grasses, herbs, and shrubs that blanketed the mountains. With a keen sense of smell, they could detect water sources and fresh vegetation, even under a blanket of snow. This ability to adapt to their environment and make the most of limited resources was a testament to their resilience. The lifestyle of the Pyrenean ibex was one of solitude and independence. They were not herd animals, but rather, they preferred to roam alone or in small groups. The males were particularly solitary, often only seeking out female company during the mating season. At the peak of their existence, the Pyrenean ibex numbered in the tens of thousands, dotting the mountains with their presence. They played a crucial role in the ecosystem, influencing the vegetation patterns and providing a source of food for predators. They were an integral part of the Pyrenees, contributing to the balance of this high-altitude habitat. However, beneath the surface of this seemingly idyllic existence, a storm was brewing. The Pyrenean ibex, like many species before and after it, was not immune to the harsh realities of life on Earth. Their existence was a delicate balance, a dance with nature that was increasingly influenced by the actions of mankind. Despite their robust numbers, the Pyrenean ibex was destined for a tragic fate. The downfall of the Pyrenean ibex was not a sudden event. It was a gradual decline marked by several contributing factors. Like an intricate tapestry woven with threads of human interference, the fate of these majestic creatures was intertwined with our own actions and decisions. The Pyrenean ibex, also known as the Bucardo, were once abundant in the Pyrenees mountains of Spain and France. They were a part of a thriving ecosystem contributing to the balance of nature. But as time went by, their numbers began to dwindle. One of the primary reasons for this decline was overhunting. Humans, with their ever-growing need for resources, began hunting the ibex for their meat and horns. The ibex, unaccustomed to such predation, found themselves in a struggle for survival. The surge in hunting, coupled with a lack of effective conservation efforts, accelerated the decline of the Pyrenean ibex. Another nail in the coffin for the ibex was habitat loss. The expansion of human settlements, agriculture, and infrastructure began to encroach upon the ibex's natural habitat. The mountains they once freely roamed became fragmented, their grazing lands reduced. As their habitat shrank, so did their population. The ibex's plight was further exacerbated by climate change. Changes in temperature and precipitation patterns disrupted their food supply and breeding cycles. The ibex, already under pressure from hunting and habitat loss, were ill-equipped to adapt to these rapid environmental changes. In the face of these challenges, the Pyrenean ibex population continued to decline. Despite numerous attempts to reverse this trend, the damage was already done. The last known individual, a female named Celia, was found dead in the year 2000 her body bearing the scars of a tree fall. 
The death of Celia marked the end of the Pyrenean Ibex. It was a sobering reminder of the devastating impact of human activities on the natural world. The extinction of the Pyrenean Ibex is not just a loss for the biodiversity of the Pyrenees, but a loss for the entire planet. The last known individual, a female named Celia, died in the year 2000, marking the end of the Pyrenean Ibex. The extinction of the Pyrenean Ibex is a stark reminder of the impact of human activities on wildlife. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? The Pyrenean Ibex, or the Bucardo as it's also known, once roamed the Pyrenees mountains of Spain and France, living a life in harmony with nature. But, as we've seen, it met its end in the year 2000. The last of its kind, a female named Celia, met a tragic end. This extinction wasn't due to some natural disaster or an uncontrollable disease. No, it was the result of human actions, overhunting and habitat loss to be precise. The Pyrenean Ibex didn't just disappear, it was pushed out of existence by us. It's a hard pill to swallow, but it's the truth. So what can we learn from this? What lessons does the extinction of the Pyrenean Ibex hold for us? The first lesson is quite clear. We must respect the balance of nature. Each species, no matter how big or small, plays a vital role in maintaining the delicate balance of our ecosystems. The loss of one species can have a ripple effect, disrupting the entire ecosystem, and the Pyrenean Ibex is a prime example of this. The second lesson is about responsibility. As humans, we have a responsibility towards the other inhabitants of this planet. Responsible hunting practices and sustainable development should be the norm, not the exception. We must remember that nature is not a resource to be exploited, but a treasure to be preserved. Finally, the story of the Pyrenean Ibex highlights the importance of conservation efforts. We cannot turn back time and save the Pyrenean Ibex, but we can prevent other species from meeting the same fate. Conservation is not just about saving animals, it's about ensuring the survival of our planet, our home. The story of the Pyrenean Ibex serves as a poignant lesson for humanity. It is a call for us to respect and protect the balance of nature. And it is a call we must heed for the sake of our future generations and the future of our planet. Ever wondered how the most abundant bird species in North America went extinct? Once upon a time, not too long ago, the skies of North America were darkened by an avian spectacle like no other. These were the glory days of the passenger pigeon, scientific name Ectopistes migratorius. The sheer volume of these birds was staggering. Their flocks, numbering in the billions, were so dense and extensive that they could block out the sun for hours, even days at a time. Imagine, if you will, a sea of birds stretching as far as the eye could see, their collective wings creating a thunderous roar that echoed across the vast American landscape. This was not a rare sight in the 19th century. It was a common occurrence, a part of the natural rhythm of life. The passenger pigeon was a nomadic species, always on the move in search of food and nesting grounds. Their migration patterns were cyclical, predictable, yet awe-inspiring. They traversed thousands of miles across the continent, from the dense forests of the east to the prairies of the west, following the bountiful crops of acorns, chestnuts, and beech nuts. The early settlers, both in awe and fear, watched these migrations with bated breath. They marveled at the sheer abundance of life, the spectacle of nature on a scale that was almost unimaginable. The passenger pigeon was a symbol of the wild, untamed beauty of the New World, a testament to the richness of its ecosystems. Their habitat was as varied as their diet. From the dense, deciduous forests of the east to the open, grassy plains of the Midwest, these birds adapted and thrived. They nested in vast colonies, each one a bustling city of birds, filled with the constant chatter and flutter of wings, the passenger pigeon was a marvel of nature, a spectacle of abundance. But this abundance did not last. Their story is a stark reminder of the transient nature of life, the fragile balance of ecosystems, and the irreversible consequences of human actions. So, how did such an abundant species vanish from our skies? Stay tuned as we delve into the downfall of the passenger pigeon.
The passenger pigeon's downfall started almost as soon as their discovery by European settlers. This magnificent bird, once a dominant species in North America, began to suffer greatly under the pressures of human activity. Unbeknownst to them, the settlers had stumbled upon a gold mine of sorts. The passenger pigeon was an easy target. Its large flocks and predictable migration patterns made it an ideal source of food. The birds were hunted relentlessly for their meat, which was a cheap and plentiful source of protein. Hotels and restaurants served pigeon meat as a delicacy, and it was also canned and shipped to feed urban populations. But it wasn't just the pigeon's meat that was in demand. Their soft, downy feathers were highly sought after, too. These were used to fill pillows and mattresses, while longer feathers found use as quills. The commercial hunting of these birds for their feathers became a profitable industry in itself. Sport also played a role in the passenger pigeon's demise. Shooting contests were organized where participants would compete to bring down as many pigeons as they could. These events were not just a test of skill, but a social occasion, with spectators often enjoying a pigeon feast afterwards. As if hunting pressures weren't enough, the passenger pigeon also had to contend with widespread habitat destruction. The rapid expansion of agriculture led to extensive deforestation, robbing the pigeons of their nesting and feeding grounds. Efforts were made to conserve the species, but they came too late and were largely ineffective. Laws were passed to limit hunting and protect habitats, but enforcement was lax. The passenger pigeon's high reproductive rate, which had once ensured its survival, was no match for the scale of human exploitation. So, it was a perfect storm of relentless hunting, habitat destruction, and failed conservation efforts that brought about the downfall of the passenger pigeon. A combination of human actions and environmental changes led to the rapid decline of this once abundant species. But the story doesn't end there, and the legacy of the passenger pigeon continues to resonate today. By the early 20th century, the passenger pigeon was on the brink of extinction. The once abundant bird, which had flocked in multitudes, was now reduced to a mere handful of survivors. Among these was a solitary bird named Martha who had become symbolic of the species' tragic demise. Martha, the last known passenger pigeon, lived her final years in captivity at the Cincinnati Zoo. Martha was born in a world where her species was already disappearing. She never experienced the grand spectacle of billions of her kin darkening the skies. Instead, she lived her life in a small cage, watched over by those who understood the significance of her existence. As the years passed, efforts were made to prevent the inevitable. Breeding programs were initiated and Martha was paired with a male named George. But their union bore no fruit, no offspring to carry on the legacy of the passenger pigeon. George died in 1910, leaving Martha as the last of her kind. The world watched and waited. Every silent day in Martha's cage was a countdown, a ticking clock towards the inevitable. The hope that had once surrounded the breeding program slowly faded, replaced by a grim acceptance of the fate that was to come. On September 1, 1914, the inevitable occurred. Martha, the final beacon of the passenger pigeon, was found lifeless in her cage. The news of her death spread quickly, a somber reminder of the consequences of humanity's actions. The extinction of the passenger pigeon was more than just the loss of a species. It was a poignant statement about the impact of human activity on the natural world. In the aftermath of Martha's death, the world was forced to confront the reality of what had transpired. The extinction of the passenger pigeon was officially recognized, marking the end of an era. With the death of Martha, the last of her kind, the passenger pigeon was officially declared extinct. In the wake of their disappearance, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was established in the United States in 1918, an international agreement that aimed to protect migratory birds from indiscriminate hunting. This was a direct response to the fate of the passenger pigeon, a testament to the profound impact their extinction had on shaping public policy. But the story of the passenger pigeon doesn't end there. In a twist of irony, the same species that drove them to extinction is now trying to bring them back. Through the marvels of genetic engineering, scientists are working on reviving the passenger pigeon.
Using DNA extracted from preserved specimens, they hope to resurrect this extinct species, a testament to the incredible advancements in science and our enduring desire to right past wrongs. The passenger pigeon serves as a stark reminder of the devastating effects of unchecked human activities on wildlife. Their story, though tragic, spurred a new era of wildlife conservation, and their legacy continues to inspire us today. As we move forward, let's ensure that the lessons we've learned from the passenger pigeon guide our actions, so that no more species have to pay the ultimate price for our negligence.